And welcome to the uh, Population Studies Colloquium. It's a pleasure, pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Joshua Wassi. Uh, Josh received his PhD in Sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's currently an NSF funded postdoctoral researcher at Princeton University. Uh, despite his uh, a short career and uh, being so young, uh, Josh has already accomplished uh, quite a thing for himself. You know, he's kind of like a specialist in issues of return migration and uh, uh, low skill migration in, in Mexico. And uh, he has written an annual review of sociology piece summarizing what we know about uh, return migration. And uh, he has had many publications in the area and uh, uh, population research and policy reviews, social forces, uh, just to name a few. Uh, today he's going to talk to us about his new project on the changing nature and characteristics of Mexican migration uh, to the US. So please help me welcome uh, Joshua Wasi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Emilio, for the invitation to present and for the very generous introduction. Um, so, yeah, today I'm going to present some research I've been doing on changes in migration to Mexico and the United States. Temporary entry into the U.S. on non immigrant guest worker visas from Mexico grew from just 36,000 in 1997 to over 900,000 in 2017. And these temporary visas have all been replaced on authorized migration as the dominant mode of entry from Mexico into the United States. So to imperate that uh, transition, I'll address three major questions. What factors contributed to the transformation of Mexico's migration? What mechanisms underlie the new system of migration? And do the social and institutional foundations of unauthorized Mexico's migration contribute to guest worker to answer those questions, I'll first document the transition from unauthorized to guest worker movement. Then I'll develop a conceptual model to explain the new process of Mexican migration, which I'll test with data from the Mexican Migration Project. And in conclusion, I'll consider the implications of the new migration system for the United States. The U.S.'s last major guest worker program or initiative, the Bracero Program, was created in 1942 by an executive order to address agricultural labor shortages during World War II. In 1952, the United States actually wrote a separate guest worker program into law at the age of the visa. But because the Bracero program was already operational, it saw little use. The Bracero program, which was initiated as a modest wartime measure, and quietly expanded. And by the late 1950s, nearly half a million Mexicans circulated annually between the United States and Mexico on these temporary visas. However, increasing activism against abuse of Bracero workers led uh, Congress to allow legislation to expire in 1964. But the expiration of the Bracero program did not end the use of Mexican migrant labor in U.S. agriculture. This fracture of the annual composition of Mexican migration to the United States, calculated in the Mexican Migration Project, which I'll describe in more detail later on, um, and as you can see, the end of the Bracero program in 1964 corresponded almost exactly to the rapid expansion of unauthorized migration, which would dominate movement from Mexico to the United States over the next 40 years. What had happened was that by, by the late 1950s, a massive circular flow of Mexican migrants had become ingrained and deeply embedded in U.S. employer practices and also in the expectations of the migrants. And this, these practices and expectations have come to be sustained by well-developed and widely accessible migrant and recruiter network or networks, which connect the sending communities in Mexico with employers and communities in the United States. From 1965 to 1985, undocumented border crossing became a routine process that was socially institutionalized and highly scripted. First-time migrants drew heavily on social networks to connect them to reliable guides to escort them across the border. In, in, in tandem with these expanding networks, active employer recruitment and the emergence of intermediaries like border smugglers contributed to the rapid expansion of unauthorized migration flows. 
And then in turn, over the course of repeated trips, migrants themselves accumulated personal resources, such as border crossing experience and familiarity with the US, with particular destinations that they could draw upon to make additional northern trips. Together, these network ties, personal experiences, and intermediaries sustained the steady expansion of undocumented migration in the post posterior era. But after decades of an authorized cross border movement, two structural shifts initiated a period of transition in Mexican US migration. First, Mexico underwent a rapid demographic transition as its total fertility rate dropped from seven births per woman in 1965 to just two and a half in 2000. And as a result, the, population, the country experienced rapid population aging. Labor migration displays a characteristic age curve, rising rapidly in the late teens, peaking at age 22 or 23, and then steadily declining. And at present, the average age in Mexico is 29, and fertility stands at just 2.15 births per woman, effectively removing the demographic surplus of young workers at risk of taking a first undocumented trip. The second shift involved a gradual increase in guest worker migration, which began with the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act, or IRCA, in 1986. As undocumented migration grew during the late 1970s, politicians recognized that they could mobilize anti-immigrant sentiment in order to curry political favor, a process that the anthropologist Leo Chavez has referred to as the, the quote, Latino threat narrative, unquote. This rising anti-immigrant sentiment set the stage for IRCA, a bipartisan bill that was intended to effectively end undocumented immigration. IRCA was designed to end undocumented migration using a four-pronged strategy. It would first offer amnesty to long-term undocumented U.S. residents, thus wiping its like clean for future enforcement. Second, it would dramatically increase border enforcement to forestall future entries. Third, it would impose penalties on U.S. Employers to discourage the use of undocumented labor. And fourth, to address employer demand for workers to fill low skilled occupations, IRCA subdivided the existing H2 program into two categories H2A visas for agricultural work occupations and H2B visas for non agricultural work. The H2B visas were capped at 66000 per year, but no numerical limit was placed on H2A visas. The H2 visa also requires U.S. employers to give preference to workers already in the labor market. Therefore, to hire guest workers, they need to demonstrate a labor of shortage in their local labor market by advertising on those positions in local newspapers and for other venues, and upon approval, conduct costly international recruitment efforts. So not surprisingly, the owner's H2 application process initially dissuaded U.S. employers from pursuing this avenue given the high rate of unauthorized migration already occurring. But steady growth in border enforcement from just $500 million in 1990, which you can see here, in tandem with numerous region-specific investments in border enforcement, led to a rapid increase in the cost of undocumented migration. So here, the cost of undocumented migration is estimating the, the fees um, paid to a border smuggler or other intermediary based on data from the migration project. And you can see that the average rose from just $1,000 for an undocumented trip in 1990 to $7,000 in 2016. Now, as numerous scholars have shown, these investments in border security had the unintended consequence of encouraging seasonal undocumented workers to settle in the United States, often subsequently bringing family members to join them there. In the two decades following IRCA, the number of Mexicans living in the United States ballooned from just 3.5 million in 1986 to a high of nearly 12 million in 2007. But as undocumented migration began to slow due to demographic change in Mexico, the rising cost of unauthorized entry, combined with U.S. employers' persistent demand for workers to fill those skilled occupations, led to the second structural shift, the expansion of guest worker migration. So here you can see the number of border apprehensions reported by the Department of Homeland Security, which scholars view as a proxy for the, the rate of undocumented migration. Between 2000 and 2018, the number of Mexicans apprehended at the border fell from 1.6 million all the way down to 150,000. Similarly, estimates from the Mexican Migration Project indicate the annual probability of embarking on a person-documented trip among Mexican adults fell from 1.24% 
1999, just one tenth of one percent in 2017. And the rapid decline in unauthorized migration led to an overall decline in annual immigration from Mexico. Here are estimates that Pew Research Center generated using a residual method to infer annual inflows. And you can see that these trends reflect the previous two charts, illustrating the contribution of unauthorized migration to a substantial overall decline in movement from Mexico to the US. Scholars have widely observed the rapid decline in unauthorized migration from Mexico, yet less well known is the corresponding surge in entry on guest worker visas. So here you can see the red line plotting the annual entry annual probability, or the blue line plotting annual probability of undocumented migration alongside annual Mexican entries on temporary guest worker visas, shown in red, which are provided by the U.S. State Department. Guest worker entries rose little in the first decade after IRCA, which corresponded to sustained levels of unauthorized migration. But as unauthorized migration began to slow in the late 1990s, entry on guest worker visas increased rapidly, from just 36,000 in 1997 to 700,000 in 2011, and have continued rising since then, passing 900,000 in 2017. And I should also note that the rise in guest worker migration likely resulted not just from increasing costs of unauthorized entry, but also from rising and increasing crackdown on employers hiring unauthorized workers in particular states. For example, House Bill 56, which was passed in Alabama in 2011, uh, forbid employers from knowingly hiring unauthorized workers and required the enforcement to be verified to ensure that all workers were legally authorized to work in the United States. Thus, as the, um, as the cost of undocumented migration began to rise, U.S. employers also had to be consented to work with legal workers, suggesting a process of substitution in which entry on non-immigrant visas took the place of unauthorized migration. Consistent with the substitution process, you can see the rise in guest worker entries from Mexico almost perfectly mirroring the recent decline in the size of the US undocumented workforce, as estimated by the Research Center. And more so, if we focus specifically on H2 workers, which account for the majority of Mexican entries on non immigrant visas, and also reflect the two largest um, visas for low skill occupations for any guest workers, it becomes clear that almost all of the growth in entry on these visas stems from rising migration from Mexico specifically, which accounted for 92% of age migration in 2017. So the Mexico-U.S. migration system appears to have entered a new epoch in which undocumented entries nearly disappear, and documented laborers entering on temporary guest worker visas comprise the majority of new entries. Where the unauthorized migration is an extra-legal process, grounded in informal social network formation, illicit intermediaries, and covert employment in the United States, entry as temporary guest workers is more of a bureaucratic exercise. In order to import legal temporary workers, U.S. employers must first submit a temporary labor certification application for TLCA, which you can see here, to the U.S. Department of Labor, in a TLCA, they provide evidence of a labor shortage and that hiring temporary workers will not adversely affect local wages or employment conditions. When TLCAs are certified, employers then submit Form I-129, a petition for non-immigrant workers to U.S. Customs and Immigration Services. USCIS regulations govern the visa process and require that employers demonstrate that the job qualifies for the specified visa category, uh, and that the foreign workers named in the form meet the job qualifications specified by the employer. Because there's no cap on H-2A visas, um, most of the positions certified by the DOL lead to a visa being given out. There's often a larger gap between the number of H-2B applications which are certified by the DOL and the number of visas out, um, allotted by USCIS. But in recent years, corresponding to the decline in unauthorized entry, Congress has consistently increased the number of H2B visas by between 15 and 60,000. And there are actually talks right now to increase, to permanently increase the annual limit from 66,000 up to 100,000. Upon approval from USCIS, prospective H2 workers then proceed to a port of entry, such as the one in Monterey, which is pictured here, where they complete a DS-160 form, pay the visa application fee, 
submit a valid passport, petition number, proof of payment, attend appointments to submit a photograph and fingerprints, complete a visa interview, and then finally, if approved, enter the United States. As the preceding discussion suggests, like unauthorized entry, guest worker migration is a complex process and one that relies on numerous actors at multiple stages. Because H-2 visas are granted in response to petitions from U.S. employers or labor recruiters, Mexicans necessarily depend on these gatekeepers to gain entry for the temporary workers. Thus, guest worker migration is most commonly initiated by recruiters. However, once listed on a petition, prospective migrant workers have a high likelihood of gaining entry. These migrants can then themselves become conduits for friends and neighbors to subsequently enter the United States. Indeed, network-based recruitment of legal temporary workers appears to be quite common. In a survey of North Carolina poultry processors, for example, the anthropologist David Griffith found that 100% of the hiring agents reported relying on migrant recommendations to fill out their workforces, and about a third said that they offer cash bonuses to current workers for recruiting additional migrant labor. Some employers even send workers home to recruit additional migrants in their communities of origin. For example, uh, or according to Vanessa Casanova and Josh McDaniel, one firm employing Guatemalan and Honduran guest workers was so impressed by one particular employee. They sent him home to, quote, find more workers just like him, unquote. And all of that firm's Honduran guest workers came from rural communities in the same area, and all of their Guatemalan guest workers came from a single rural village. These network ties to existing guest workers and their employers are essential to navigating the bureaucratic uh, visa process. Kirsten Dillinger accompanied a U.S. employer on two journeys to Monterey, one to arrange for the entry of H-2A workers, and then another one later in the year to bring in H-2B workers. Before arriving in Mexico, in each case, the employer completed and organized their applications. And then once in Monterey, he and the assistant carefully checked all the forms and applicants identification documents and prepped them for their consular interviews. In this way, Dellinger argues that U.S. employers and their leaders act as, quote, couriers, unquote, in the visa application process. Given the significant costs involved in recruiting and training guest workers, employers have a strong incentive to rehire the same workers year over year. And migrants have come to recognize the value of employer sponsorship, especially as undocumented border crossings become increasingly hazardous and expensive. As Casanova and McDaniel observed, workers protect their jobs and access to networks, which is advantageous to all involved. So these case studies suggest that the expansion of guest worker migration appears to follow a social process similar to that observed among unauthorized migrants. In both cases, movement is initiated by active recruitment on the part of employers, and then sustained by the accumulation of migration-specific resource, resources and experience, network expansion, and the emergence of intermediaries who guide migrants through the border crossing process. The nature and character of these networks, intermediaries and experiences, however, appears to be quite different. And so thinking about my third research question, do the social and institutional foundations of an authorized mechanism of migration contribute to guest worker movement? What I'll argue is that although they sort of follow similar processes of expansion and maintenance, they rely on very different sets of resources that undocumented migrants over time benefited from a variety of, of resources, from general social capital, ties to friends and family members with migration experience, who could provide information about destinations in the United States, as well as financial support in locating a border smuggler. And similarly, the migrants accumulate knowledge of um, sort of how the process of unauthorized entry, where to cross the border and where to go in the US, which is specific to, the, to undocumented migration, but may not be transferable. And in particular, the, the bureaucratic process of guest worker migration suggests that first-time migrants will likely rely on more specific social ties and more specific recruitment processes, which may not overlap with more general migration experience, that being able to identify a safe border crossing site will not be particularly useful in securing a visa to enter. And similarly, general migration experience will not provide 
the value of employer with um, migrant relationship, because, but it's the same with migration over time. And so I'll explore in the final section is how guest worker migration and how non-price migration emerge and expand in communities, and how the sort of the mechanisms that appear to drive that expansion and then sustain it are similar or different. To examine those expectations, I'll draw upon detailed life histories compiled for Mexican household heads by the Mexican Migration Project, the DMMP. Each year since 1987, the MMP uh, has randomly sampled 46 households, or his, 46 communities, in has randomly sampled about 200 households in 46 strategically selected communities, and then conducted responded dribbling spirit sampling among migrants from those communities in the United States. Data are collected using a combination of ethnographic and survey methods, which are employed to compile detailed information about the communities, the households, household members, and in particular the household head. Each household head provides a complete life history, which is centered on work, migration, and family context. And as of 2018, the MMP sample included 27,000 households. Um, in 170 communities spread across 24 of Mexico's 32 states. And although it doesn't come from a nationally representative survey, it's been validated against surveys conducted by the Mexican Census Bureau as a valid source of information to specifically characterize patterns of migration in New Mexico and the U.S. And for this project in particular, it provides a unique information source because of both its temporal coverage, captured migration, patterns both throughout the period of undocumented movement, and also more recently as a uh, guest worker movement we picked up. And it also collects detailed information about the mode of entry, which I used to disentangle undocumented entrants from come on guest visas and other types of entry. So in some of the communities, they have been uh, sampled in 1982 and never sampled again. That's right. And so in the, in the regression results, I'll include results that are restricted to more recent communities, because those are the ones where we would expect guest worker migration to pick up. Um, we'll talk more about that. Um, so first, before I get into any results, I just want to walk through the data a little bit, and I'll be... We're, we're trying to understand, so every year they add four to six? Yes, 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 that's right. So they survey four to six communities each year, and they don't go back to the same communities. They collect retrospective migration histories for the individuals. So it's more recently surveyed communities that collect more information about um, guest worker migration. So, yeah, so some of those trends will come out if I look at the data a little bit. Um, so this is just the total guest worker trips in communities and here's surveyed since 2000. Um, and the main thing to know is just in most communities there's very little guest worker migration. And then you can see there's kind of that handful that appear to pick up some more momentum and sort of develop the trajectory. I think some of these lower levels may have to do with Perhaps a recruiter coming to work guest workers, but a smaller operation who only wants five or six workers. The average number of workers requested, like British to ABC, is for the median, is five or six. It's pretty low. But then you can see some communities begin to develop much larger patterns. And if you compare that to undocumented migration, overall the levels are much higher, but I think largely reflects the longer scope of unauthorized entries. So community in 2005 could have been sending um, unauthorized migrants since 1965, but it really didn't pick up. Whereas the guest worker migration you know, began to grow slowly after 1996 and really picked up in 1997. Um, and then looking at this, here I ordered them by the year of the survey. So this is the number of guest worker trips. And again, you can see getting back to the issue of timing, Communities surveyed more recently have more time to establish a large guest worker migration flow, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and so we you know, kind of expect when we survey around 2000, just don't have as much time to establish that flow. We went back to some of these earlier dots that could have risen significantly as well. So, how are the 46 communities selected? So, they're basically selected each year to expand, either to get at sort of whatever's a, a hot 
but you know, there's a new region that's going to start sending more migrants or to add new states to the data. Um, so originally they were selected in the area kind of central west heartland of an authorized migration. And since then they began, in large part, have just continued to expand the coverage. So now it covers 24 effects to 32 states. And they are continuing to kind of broadening the, the geographic. Is there a maximum population size in the communities? No, they vary widely. Many of them are small, small rural areas with one or two thousand households, but then they also include large urban areas with a million residents. And in that case, they would pick a community within the large urban area within which they collect their sample. But there's a, a range in terms of urban rural. Um, and so here, this is showing the number of undocumented trips and the number of guest worker trips plotted on the, um, the y-axis for undocumented and the x-axis for the temporary. And I just want to highlight how there's, so overall there's very little correlation between the two. So thinking back to what I talked about in terms of these two patterns <coughs> kind of developing in parallel to one another and then the resources that enable undocumented migration not necessarily translating to guest worker migration. I think it's particularly noteworthy that the sort of outliers of communities that develop a really large level of one to the other also tend to be have really low levels of so the communities with the most guest worker migration tend to be really low, relatively low along this line. And in particular the communities with really high established patterns of undocumented migration have quite low guest worker migration. So descriptively at the community level there's not a lot of evidence of correlation. Next. Can yeah. I ask a clarification question? Mm -hmm. So, um, can you, so because they, the survey collects retrospective uh, mm -hmm. information on trips, can you condition on trips occurring since 2000 as opposed to survey occurring since 2000? Yes. Yeah, it's very, I haven't done that here, but that's a great okay. suggestion. Because I guess that would be a little bit of a cleaner comparison. Of yeah, for the um, Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and so next, so this is community level correlations, and then this is showing the number of trips taken in a given year. So the x axis is the year, and then each dot is the community's number of trips in that year, just to get a sense of how sort of these patterns evolve. And here, these are the four communities with the largest uh, guest worker flows, with guest worker trips in blue and undocumented trips in red. And there are two things I want to highlight in these trends. First, there's not a clear patterning between undocumented trips and guest worker trips. In some cases, you see them kind of develop, develop, uh, develop together with undocumented perhaps leading the way. In some cases, guest worker migration expands on its own, very little undocumented migration. Um, this is here and here a little bit. Here, there's more some undocumented experience previously, and then guest worker can just grow here. But there's not a, a strong trend between them. And the second thing to note is that for the most part, with the guest worker trips, it's not um, there's not like a sudden jump from zero one year to twenty the next, suggesting that the employer comes in and says, "I need thirty workers." But rather, there's kind of these gradual trends upward um, in these different cases, where they begin with a couple workers and then it rises, which is consistent with the, sort of the kind of intra-community expansion of these migration flows that's been documented in the case study. For an employer might have a handful of guest workers, but then as they continue to fill their labor needs over the coming years, they basically recruit through those workers, sending them back, to, you know, when, say, when you go home to your community, find three more people to come with you. And guest worker visas are for six months? That's a good, right. that's a good question. So the guest worker visas, um, the visa itself can be constructed three years, but you can only stay in the U.S. usually for less than 12 months. Usually it's like eight months, um, so it usually be time like with an agricultural season. So these workers circulate annually, um, and then you know generally, I'll look more at first in repeat migrations. But a uh, given visa, that worker can come three times, um, and there's no limit on the number of visas a worker can receive. Um, it's just a lower bureaucratic hurdle. Um, but so here, 
Yeah, it looks like there is sort of this gradual expansion of the networks, um, which suggests sort of a pattern of district community recruitment and expansion similar to what has been um, documented for undocumented migration, but operating through distinct networks and perhaps with distinct resources and institutions. So to explore that a little more, um, I'll go through some event history models with competing risks. And what I'll do in these is I'll, it's an S, uh, discrete time multi-number logic where we're predicting the probability of entry in your T plus one in one of four visa categories, either as an unauthorized migrant as a guest worker, as a, on a tourist visa or on a legal, uh, with legal permanent residence. So the full model includes all four of these outcomes with the reference being no entry. In the results, I'm just going to focus on these two categories which are the most theoretically interesting, but I'm happy to comment on the latter through the Q&A. And then on the right-hand side of the model, I'll have a set of kind of theoretically interesting variables represented by this X measured in year T, which capture general migration experience, um, so sort of general migration ties, sort of access to friends, family members, um, with migration experience, and then also some mode of entry specific measures of networks and experience that I'll talk about in a minute. And I'll also hold constant um, a set of sociodemographic and contextual variables that I'll go over. Um, so kind of the, so the migration specific indicators reflected in that included in that X variable, first are just these general migrant ties, things that we know are strongly correlated with the probability of an authorized migration, ties to parents, spouses, siblings, or children with this migration experience. Because um, these, again, are potential sources of information and incentive to migrate to reunify a source of um, financial resources to afford an unauthorized trip. Um, and then I created two sets of mode of entry specific variables. First, um, at the community level, so in research on unauthorized migration, it's common to look at the prevalence ratio, which just captures conventionally the prevalence of adults in a community with prior U.S. migration experience as a general indicator of sort of access to social networks, the stock of information, the potential for migration-related industry to develop with access to smugglers and this sort of thing. And what I'm going to do is categorize these separately. So hypothesizing that the prevalence of unauthorized migration may not have any effect or any association with the probability of traveling with a guest worker, but perhaps the prevalence of guest workers will be a more stronger predictor as it's kind of an indicator of these intra-community networks that tend to expand with particular employers and particular communities sending an, uh, an increasing number of workers. And then looking at repeat migration, I'll do a similar thing to think about the role of individual migration experience. So that again, if you travel with an undocumented migrant, you could have gained knowledge about how to cross the border may not even rely on a smuggler. You might know where you're going to go and where you work in the US, which all could make it easier to migrate again as an undocumented migrant. But those experiences and resources don't necessarily have much bearing on your ability to connect with a U.S. employer who's specifically looking for guest workers to get that sponsorship. Whereas, as the literature suggests, once migrant travels as a guest worker, there's sort of a strong incentive between a migrant and their particular employer to maintain that relationship over time. Because it saves a tremendous amount of bureaucratic burden for the employer. The workers gain some human capital in terms of job-specific skills to make them potentially desirable. And for the workers, if, as long as they continue to want to enter the U.S., they have a strong incentive. Or that that sort of creates an easier path to entry going like forward. Uh, Sorry, yeah, that's you can change that. Um, that's legal yeah. permanent residence. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are family members who gain permanent residence. Um, so then, in all of the Models I'll hold constant um, demographic characteristics, schooling, occupational status, um, household assets, sufficient measures to provide national context, support, full budget, rate of U.S. employment growth, um, next to GDP per capita, GDP per capita growth, and then also community size and period of observation. Um, so these are all things I can I 
won't go over these results in the talk because we're going to need some time, but I'm happy to comment on them afterwards. But just know that all the results I'm showing you are included. So, so the occupation is when? This is in year T. So if we're predicting the probability of movement in year T plus one, all of these variables are measured in year T. Um, so it's sort of saying where the movement is coming from in the US. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I play with that. The issue is the cell size gets smaller towards the end just because because the data is collected retrospectively, there's fewer and fewer communities that could have contributed migrations in more recent years. Um, so I originally tried, I tried doing this as a, a separate, and I tried even stratifying the model criteria, but it just, the cell size got too small for the different local country to support the model. So, okay, so first I'll look at um, the first trip to the US. And here, kind of the key question is how do both the general migration ties associated with the probability of entry as either an undocumented migrant or the undocumented visa, um, and then also I'll look at the mode of entry specific prevalence ratios to see if kind of your community level exposure or connection to established networks of one type or the other is correlated with subsequent entry. Um, and so basically, the basic structure of the model, um, I'll follow migrants. So your the earliest would be your 14th birthday, and then look at the probability of entry in the subsequent year up until near their 66th birthday, their first US trip for the year of the survey for group trips. This is showing the distribution of different types of trips within the data. Um, and so I'll just highlight that this basically mirrors um, the patterns from other sources. Um, but we see undocumented entry kind of dominating in different countries since the end of the Bracero program in 1964 until very recently when entry up to the temporary US worker has begun to go a little bit and then expanding very rapidly in the last few years. Okay, so here um, I'm going to focus basically looking across models at sort of the direction and the significance of these relationships to sort of understand across a wide variety of variables, um, what kind of the patterns of associations that are, are. It's difficult for human reasons to substantively interpret the magnitude of the coefficients, in particular because the period includes so many more undocumented trips than guest worker trips. So it's sort of hard to interpret why one coefficient is larger or smaller because it has much more like to do with the number of, of cases in one category. So what I'll do here is for three specifications, first of all, the models include the associated demographic controls and the cluster standard errors. Then in the second columns, I drop the top four H2 sending communities to see if there's some sort of an outlier effect for certain communities that are driving the results. And then in the third column, I also restrict it in the survey just since 2000, um, just to sort of make sure there's not different you know, weird patterns in the data. And then blue moving from light to dark indicates significant associations um, with darker being more statistically significant and orange are positive associations and then orange from light to dark is significant associations uh, that are negative. And so the first thing to look at for undocumented entry is we find basically what's been found before that pretty much any general migrant uh, ties to migration experience, connections to existing networks are positively correlated with an individual probability of migrating. All these sort of family ties increase the likelihood. Um, even the prevalence of guest workers is positively associated, which could capture sort of a relative deprivation effect that if your neighbor is migrating as a guest worker and accumulate wealth, even maybe even if you can't migrate as a guest worker, you have a greater incentive to migrate because uh, you see the potential returns available. Um, but definitely a very strong association for the undocumented prevalence, which again is consistent with prior research that sort of both general and specific migration, network ties, and resources are positively associated with undocumented movement. And then when we compare that with guest worker entry, the results are quite different. There's no evidence, really, of any positive 
association between sort of general migration ties and the value of the investor from the internet. There's a couple positive coefficients to look out, there's some pretty strong negative coefficients, which look like they're operating to family ties and people from the residents who can potentially provide access to from the residents. And then there's also no relationship between the prevalence of undocumented migration. So going back to those community level plots, the community level plots that showed essentially a zero correlation between undocumented trips and guest worker trips. When we look at individual movement on first trip, we see the same that the communities accumulating get uh, unauthorized experience, the potential expansion of border crossing networks and ties to US employers will hire undocumented workers show no relationship with predict uh, future guest worker movement. The only real clear signal is the legal the prevalence of legal temporary migration, which is strong and positive across all the models. And so what this suggests consistent with previous research is that these networks tend to expand so you're predicting the first entry through kind of intra guest worker networks, first one two migrants who get recruited, and then they expand that flow through their kind of community as you know as additional workers are recruited, um, but kind of unrelated to kind of established history of adoption migration. Um, so next I'll turn to models for um, examining additional trips. And here I'll follow migrants beginning from the year they return to Mexico from a trip to the U.S. So they accumulated U.S. experience up until their 66th birthday or the year of the survey and then censoring any time in the U.S. on additional trips. Um, and here, so this distribution was a little bit different. Um, the biggest difference is the surge in the permanent residents, which happened probably Urca, which naturalized um, a large number of unauthorized Mexican migrants who are in the U.S. But there is the same trend where there's extremely low levels of guest worker movement and high levels of undocumented movement until more recently when guest worker migration began to expand. Um, so again, these trends are kind of consistent with the overall pattern. And again, these models often include the same variables from the first set of analyses, but also those measures of individual sort of personal migration experience that they accumulate. So to begin, um, again, with a document that appeared on the, uh, on the left and guess what we're on the right, um, is the pattern a little bit murkier? There's still an indication that most forms of uh, general migration capital are predicted of additional trips from uh, additional undocumented trips. And I think these non-significant ties to family members and people permanent residents probably suggest undocumented migrants transitioning from legal permanent residents themselves, which could explain the, the null associations. Um, there's potentially some evidence of a uh, positive correlation between ties to family members and additional guest worker trips, which may suggest that pre-formally undocumented migrants sometimes, sometimes leverage ties to the United States to secure a guest worker visa for themselves if they don't want to migrate illegally again. Um, Research suggests that most return migrants do not currently uh, intend to. There are very low, ways, low levels of looking at operating migration, and most don't intend to migrate completely. Um, but there's, again, there's not a really clear pattern here. And then if we look next at the prevalence ratio, we see the same as before. That there's these very kind of rudimentary specific associations. And in particular, for, for repeat desperate movement, it remains positively correlated with illegal temporary prevalence and unrelated to their document prevalence. And then finally, bringing in personal experience, um, there are these very strong positive associations. And just to contextualize these, for the full model here, the R squared is 0.39, so it explains about 40% of the variation in additional trips. If I drop age, age squared, and sex, some kind of strong demographic predictors of the timing of movement. The R squared falls to just 0.36, so it's a small drop. If I drop just these uh, measures of prior migration experience, it falls to 0.24. So adding those variables, those indicators of sort of low entry specific experience, improves the model's planetary power by about 60%. And then you can see these very strong low entry specific associations suggesting that first trips are initiated through sort of low entry specific networks and relationships at the community level, and then additional trips continue 
to rely on those community level networks um, and if, as they expand, but are also sustained by this personal experience. And so in particular, this is highlight kind of those, the, the tie between the environment and the employer and then the common incentive to maintain that relationship. So just to summarize, um, I want to leave you with three final points before we get to Q&A. So first, I first documented the emergence of a new system of Mexico-Us migration, one grounded in the large-scale cross-border movement of temporary workers entering the United States legally on non-immigrant visas. So just remember, every time that Trump says that our country is full and talks about the problems caused by migrant workers, that this administration is fully complicit in the continued expansion of guest worker programs that primarily recruit Mexican workers to fill the same low-skill occupations commonly known by an offer. Second, previous studies document the emergence of stationary populations of undocumented migrants in Mexico and the United States largely as a result of rising U.S. border enforcement. This study extends that research by showing that these undocumented migrants exist parallel to a rapidly growing set of mobile documented workers who circulate annually back and forth using temporary on visas. This new system has its origins in the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, which expanded U.S. guest worker programs and initiated a period of steadily rising border and interior enforcement. And third, I found evidence that suggests the guest worker migration flows follow an internal logic that is similar to their unauthorized counterparts, but that the resources and institutions that sustain guest worker migration are largely distinct from the vast infrastructure that developed to sustain the developed around unauthorized migration. Thus, communities that historically amassed large amounts of undocumented migration capital may be poorly positioned to adapt to the changing US Mexico migration system. Within this new reality, many communities that historically relied on seasonal undocumented labor may be excluded from the new system, while the circulation of temporary legal workers is likely to continue expanding in a path of many Thank you again. Thank you, George. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. To what extent? is the, the recruitment process and also the approval process for the temporary worker visas um, specifically selected on people who have never gone as an unauthorized migrant because i would imagine that the people who are coming to recruit the people who are recruiting and possibly even the employers are saying we don't want someone who's previously been here unauthorized because we're worried they're going to stay on so they're selecting for people who have never gone yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the challenge, I've tried to, to get at this, the challenge is there's not great sort of spatial data to understand where like more recent migrants are coming from that can disaggregate the remote entry. So the case studies that I read suggest that employers do often target areas outside of traditional setting regions and often sort of pick out or rural, less developed communities that they think they'll most successfully improve and maintain these worker flows. And so I think that's likely contributing to sort of the parallel emergence of these new flows in different communities, um, and potentially also kind of freezing out unauthorized communities that send unauthorized migrants, because once communities develop, or flows develop within one of them sending communities to a particular place, they kind of develop within that network, within that financial. So I think that's right. Um, I don't get have the data to sort of prove it, but I think that's right. I know this is very interesting. Um, I have a question. You know, unauthorized migration um, um, did provide a lot of workers for the culture, but also provided workers to the construction industry, to the service sector industry, to the food processing industry, a bunch of other industries. And uh, I'm here comparing a document immigration in general to a program that just for agriculture. So um, it's another way of looking at this is that they basically close migration from Mexico except for agriculture. And uh, so uh, I wonder if you if if you could, for instance, compare first trip undocumented first trip to work in agriculture and see how different it is to from uh, guest workers. 
It, it seems to me that what, what the IG, if I, you know, looking at what's happening, and this is, this is, you know, when I get your reaction, you know, it seems to me that basically they sat down and they, they said, and this was studied with the Obama administration, that the agricultural industry needs Mexican workers. We're going to continue that and create this, expand this legal system, but the other kind of, you know, migration to construction, uh, service and all the stuff, that has basically stopped. So this is, a, is, is this you know, the conclusion here? So, a couple of thoughts, and I think that's a really good point. So the data here is to include H2A and H2B workers. So there are H2B workers going into construction and hotels and landscaping. It's a much smaller amount. And the H2A, the meat processing industry, is included or not? In, 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 with, in the meat processing, it depends on the specific task. So there are companies that have H2A workers raising the livestock and H2B workers processing the livestock or something like that. So it goes down. Those, right, those can go both ways. There's some wiggle room. Certainly things like construction and landscaping, which are bringing in H2B workers, but there's, there's a cap. So even when it's increased to you know, 100,000, it's not nearly sufficient for demand. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's a good suggestion in terms of thinking about agriculture specific. I'm actually moving now to trying to look more at the demand side, because there is data on just how many employers request resupply type that you see. And there's a much larger gap between the H2B petitions and the number of visa that you given out by the USCIS because we have. Um, but I think yeah, just, you know, and this is the endocrine immigration included that group of agricultural workers who are crossing the document, but included all these other right and then and and with that you know, so we can separate that. Yeah, I, well so one thing I haven't done yet, but that I can do with this is I can the H two A and H two B workers are not separated in the data. I could restrict it to like first job in agriculture as kind of an yeah. approximation, and then compare that, like you're saying, to a doctor and migrants who came from agriculture, which would be kind of an idea. Yeah. Yeah. One question about the program. The one thing is the visa, how long can they stay? Can they stay longer three years or can they go back? They, they have to go back each year. So they can come back for, for within a three year period. But and how long can they stay each time? Less, less than 12 months. 12 months. So, yeah, that's the max. Usually it's like an eight month stay. And then like they go back, but they can come on and do that. So usually the way it works is they'll come in March or April and then they'll stay until October, November. That would be for H2A visa where it's, you know, corresponding to the yeah. right. season. Um, so the festival, and then they can use the same visa for a three-year period. Yeah. Well, so the Brazil, uh, yeah, going back to the program, this is kind of wishes attached, or wishes set by the government, or by the power we This is probably for the Brazil. For the H2A, the Brazil right. program said wishes, right. and they, they were paid in Mexico, and they, they had all these other programs. So there's a, there's a long list of regulations that are placed on employers. They're required to pay for transportation and the application costs. This is for H2A, H2A is a little bit different. And they're required to provide housing. And then they have to set the wage when they apply for the visa, and it has to match sort of the prevailing industry wage in their state. The idea being that it shouldn't put down the pressure on wages. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the administrative side of it. So Fair amount of research, which is tends to kind of case studies, um, like some of the poverty law centers in expensive report 2013, which suggests a pretty high level of the employers don't comply with the regulations, high levels of wage theft, housing conditions are generally pretty bad. There's actually a move right now to make employer uh, migrants responsible for their own transportation costs and to allow employers to self-inspect the quality of housing. It seems you know, like they would have questionable incentives. Um, which, you know, just went through the comment period and got lots of favorable feedback from my cultural employers. So I think this is one of the challenges for this program. There's so much conversation right now about undocumented immigrants and the detention crisis at the border. And guest worker migration is expanding pretty rapidly, but largely outside of public conversation. I'm wondering about the 
you know, uh, there was some video for the tree, there are boxes in the remnant, uh, and what's, you know, how does that work? Do they have to like the advance, like the practice really, they bring part of the element? Yeah, that's a good question. So with these, they're, are, they're not allowed to bring family members with them. So that's one difference um, in the U.S. and in a number of places <coughs> when you compare their high-skill visas and low-skill visas. The low-skill visas tend to have very few of those sorts of side benefits. So they can't bring their family members. There's no pathway to permanent residence. So you can come with a guest worker every year for 30 years as long as they're approved, but there's no built-in um, pathway to citizenship. And the, the estimates from the State Department, they estimate overstay at less than 2%. I don't, that could be an underestimate, but I also think that workers, the migrants themselves, have a really strong incentive not to, you know, not to violate their visa. Um, so it's just pretty well. Yeah, this was very interesting. Uh, I have uh, a question about, so thinking about, okay, so how does the policy reform change the type of the characteristics of the migrants that are coming? And I'm curious to know what you learned from your research. Like, I was, uh, because of the agricultural specific sector and other requirements, like how is that changing the gender, age, kind of skill composition of the migrants that are ultimately coming? And then a follow-up question about the undocumented migration. Has that been substituted by other, um, like undocumented migrants coming from other countries? Like, the undocumented migrants are declining from Mexico, but they might be increasing, or like, you know, there's some students might like one dollar another color. Central America, do we know if that is the case? Yes, I'll do the second one first. Um, I didn't include it in the, when I showed that plot of border apprehensions, I just showed Mexico. Um, if I added other, it's growing slowly, mm -hmm. so it's gotten to maybe 200,000 in whatever the last year was, 2016, but nowhere near as high as it was for Mexico in 2018 or 1987. That's not including other types of undocumented entry, like people who come on tourist visas and overstay, mm -hmm. um, which could also be growing from other you know, global regions. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's risen to the point where it's comparable, um, okay. but that's, that's another important question. Um, in terms of characteristics, I actually uh, okay. so, I, so this is the, again, this is for household heads only. I should I need to reproduce these for more family members. So this so uh, the reason I say that is hard to compare gender because Mexican men are predominantly household heads. Um, but in terms of other characteristics, the red is undocumented and the blue is temporary. So age is pretty similar, suggesting this sort of pattern of people migrate. And this is um, characteristics in the year prior to the first trip. Um, but then we do see that guest workers tend to have less education and are overrepresented in agriculture, which is consistent with sort of targeted recruitment. Um, and they also are less likely to own property, but more likely to own land, um, and are disproportionately reside in sort of the smaller small communities. So patterns that are consistent with employers kind of recruiting intentionally in poor rural areas, the less developed at the worst of the levels. I have a final one that I basically ask the last question, but it's, it's a clarification. In North Carolina, the North Carolina Growers Association was recruiting professional workers from China. And so the H2A, we suggest how what percent this means? Are they going to other places? Because you know, the, the demographic changes in Mexico are going to happen, it's going to affect that pool too. So, right, I mean, as of 2017, H2A was 95% Mexico. So, there is a list of like eligible countries that includes numerous other countries. Um, I have a look into the title on that, but at, as it stands, it's still almost entirely Mexico. I mean, and my sense, my hypothesis there is that. When you're bringing someone in to work for one year in a low school occupation, transportation costs would be a huge consideration for employers. So they have to pay you know, the difference between a flight to Thailand and busing someone from Monterey is enormous. You have to do it every year back and forth. Um, so thus far, it's been, I know there's been some movement. I'm reading that some Central American countries, their governments are in conversation with the US to try and expand their worker migration. And that to me would seem like a more feasible 
shift as Mexico continues to develop and age. Um, but right now it's still dominated by Mexico. Thanks a lot. Thank you.